皆様こんにちは午後の2つ目のセッション洋上風力の現状と国際展開始めたいというふうに思いますセッションのモデレーターを務めます自然エネルギー財団大林と申しますそれでは少し私の方から最初に洋上風力の展開についてお話をさせていただきたいというふうに思いますまずこれは午前中にキーノートを提供してください。Note was provided from the Director General of IRENA and in the case of IRENA by 2050, the necessary CO2 reduction, 96% of them can be done by renewable and energy efficiency. And in particular, the renewable accounts for a large part. In part, the wind. Power is expected to be the largest, providing more than one third. Of course, onshore is important, but at the same time, offshore is also important. If you look at this、uh, going forward, the offshore up to 2050, 1000 gigawatt will be、uh, the size、uh, by then. The huge potential of、uh, offshore wind, according to International Energy Agency, this is the forecast. As of now, around 2018, the demand of 2018 and、uh, even going beyond the demand of electricity in 2018, there is a larger wind potential. By 2040, this is、uh, the expected、uh, power demand and the potential availability of offshore wind. And Japan is 900%, so much more than the estimated demand. However, at this moment,、uh, the cost of offshore in the case of Japan is expensive than other countries. And in particular, in terms of capacity utilization, the fossil has a very high level of、uh, capacity factors. Out of the renewable, offshore is very competitive, but still, development is lagging behind compared to other countries, according to the projection. According to Bloomberg, the offshore, in addition to the Onshore by the 2020s, it should become cheaper、uh, than new coal power plant.、Uh, this is the estimate. Whether、uh, this can be realized in Japan or not,、uh, there are many efforts ongoing across、uh, the world. Apologies that this is only in the Japanese language, but the goals of different countries. In many of the countries, they say that they go beyond 10 gigawatt、uh, by offshore wind by 2030. So, regarding the targets, we would also like to discuss. In the case of Japan, at a utility scale, this is the only、uh, energy that can be done at that large scale in Japan, what is required. By way of learning from the other、uh, countries, we would like、uh, to think what、uh, Japan can do. Thank you for your attention. Waiting to join our discussion from UK. So please go ahead. So I shall introduce Ben Backwell, CEO from Global Wind Energy Council. Good morning,、uh, Mika, and thank you very much for that、um, introduction,、uh, which I think、uh, frames things、uh, very well.、Um, and good morning, everyone in, in Tokyo.、Um, very sorry、um, I can't be here、um, this year um, uh, physically,、um, but、um, looking forward very much to、uh, being there again、uh, in Tokyo soon.、Um, so I'm going to go through. Uh, just a little bit to put in context what the challenge is、uh, and the opportunity for Japan in terms of offshore wind.、Um, so, first of all, just to quickly introduce、uh, GWEC. So, we are the、uh, 
trade association for the global uh, industry and our mission is to develop um, new markets for the for the wind industry uh, around the world um, and also to act as a global uh, voice for the industry and um, offshore wind really has become one of our kind of key um, areas um, over the last kind of three or four years as it becomes um, a, a, an important part of the um, overall uh, mix of, of, of wind. Um, uh, these are the kind of companies uh, that we you know, represent on our, uh, have represented on our board. Um, so you know, many of the uh, kind of leading offshore players. Um, and we also have a, a global um, offshore wind task force that brings together uh, um, the leading actors in the sector, um, both private sector and some institutions, to really try and speed up uh, the development. Um, so I think my my first comment is that offshore wind, you know, the potential um, is you know limitless. I mean, there's enough um, technical potential to fulfil you know world power demand many, many, many times over. And and as the global studies uh, become more detailed, the scale of the potential uh, becomes uh, clearer. So you can see this is concentrated just on uh, relatively low uh, water depths. And, and I think what uh, stands out from this um, study, which um, uh, Alistair Dutton carried out and which was then used by uh, the World Bank in its um, uh, recent Going Global report is that really we're looking at a series of regional markets. So they're not, um, you know, uh, national markets as such. I mean, they're national markets that are clustered in regions. So we can see the European region, um, which is obviously, um, you know, mature. Um, and we can see, you know, the East Coast in the US and we can see uh, East Asia as being a, a, a very important um, you know, a cluster for offshore wind resource. Um, and I'll come back to this um, in, a, in a little bit because this is a, a, an important point about where development goes. Um, so um, the characteristics of the market you know, are different from, from onshore in that we're talking about very large uh, complex uh, projects um, really a minimum size of 100 megawatts plus. Um, normal project size is anything really from 300 megawatts to 1.2 gigawatts, which is, you know, uh, the size of a, of a you know, um, a, a large, uh, you know, a nuclear plant. Um, um, and we're talking about, you know, very capital intensive projects, uh, long development timeline. And again, this is something uh, that we, should discuss. Uh, so seven to 10 years from gaining an option on, on an area to full commissioning of the wind farm. So it's quite a long uh, timeline or has been until now. Um, and then very strong reliance on political support because um, these are kind of long term um, projects um, with a large amount of upfront you know, capital that require um, you know, quite a lot of um, certainty. Um, Market-based mechanisms dominate. Um, so basically auctions and uh, tenders. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side how the amount of tendered um, offshore wind um, per megawatt by, by megawatt has, 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 has shot up over the recent years. Um, and there's you know, one or two markets which have feed-in tariffs, um, basically as a kind of you know initial introductory uh, phase. So, for instance, Taiwan um, has you know uh, an, an, an initial feed-in tariff. Uh, Vietnam is still with a, a, an initial feed-in tariff that's going to expire in the next couple of years. But in general, markets have moved uh, very quickly to um, large-scale um, auctioning. And then we're also looking in some countries and areas around uh, merchant um, offshore wind. So in the UK, we have a CFD scheme, but we're also seeing some projects um, that are trying to bring uh, to completion projects outside of the CFD. Um, or we're seeing uh, companies bring projects which are partly supported by um, CFDs, uh, but are partly um, merchants, so part of the project. 
will come directly to wholesale markets. Um, and we're also seeing um, in some some countries uh, the idea of what are known as uh, subsidy free auctions, which are basically auctions that are based entirely on um, the future wholesale market prices. Uh, so without any kind of kind of price floor or or um, uh, other mechanism um, to um, to um, uh, to provide um, long term visibility. And again, yeah, that's something that is it's is worth discussing whether that's the way the market is going to go or whether that's the way the market should go. Um, bid levels um, have come down. Sorry, have come down uh, dramatically. Um, you know, offshore wind is already competitive um, and it's already a mature technology. I mean, there's no, I mean, I think, you know, looking at the Jap Japan discussion, I mean, there's no particular reason why offshore wind should be expensive anymore anywhere. Um, obviously, it requires a development, um, you know, a curve. You know, there needs to be a certain amount of capacity and supply capacity built, supply chain capacity built up. Uh, in any particular market, but in in terms of international level, it's already um, very very competitive with uh, fossil fuel um, around the world, and obviously it's you know it's clean and um, it's um, really you know one of the only technologies that can provide you know large scale uh, clean energy in kind of large you know uh, blocks of power, um, and and I think that's why um, offshore wind has now got huge policy uh, momentum behind it, whether that's from the IEA or IRENA or G20, uh, World Bank, all the international institutions um, are lining up uh, to try and push for offshore wind uh, because of this um, um, characteristic. And, and I'd also mention that the system effect, you know, capacity factors are high um, in offshore wind um, and, you know, uh, 50s and above, um, and that provides a kind of attractive you know, profile, you know, throughout the day uh, and, and, and night for, for power systems as well, a kind of a pseudo uh, baseload um, uh, uh, power as well, uh, which is attractive for government. So, you know, bid levels are at, you know, 50 level, uh, $50 uh, and below in places like the UK and, and uh, Germany. And those are the next generation of wind farms that are, are being built out. Um, and it really come down um, over the last, uh, five years, particularly, uh, very, very dramatically through um, these large-scale um, auctions. Um, innovation and efficiency are the key uh, growth drivers. So, basically, you know, uh, um, larger, you know, much larger turbines. So there's a kind of, um, you know, kind of arms race among um, turbine manufacturers to get to bigger turbines, uh, pushed by the developers um, and by these um, aggressive uh, bid levels um, so we can now see you know, turbines moving very quickly from you know kind of five megawatts to eight megawatts to now you know testing uh, 12 uh, megawatts with the GE um, Halyard and and other companies now at 10 megawatts and, and already you know starting to um, uh, uh, look at their next um, a generation of turbines um, as well, and, and and it's a really you know dramatic um, increase in power uh, capture that these uh, turbines um, um, you know uh, produce by going to this larger size. So if you look at the Haliad, it's you know it's something like um, uh, you know thirty percent higher capture compared to the eight megawatt, and it's twice as much as their previous um, GE's previous uh, Haliad uh, six. Uh, six megawatts. So it's you know it's pretty dramatic kind of increase in in turbine sizes, um, and obviously what this is doing is it's taking advantage of the same um, you know logistics in terms of foundations and and cabling. Um, so taking advantage of the same kind of fixed uh, base and the same fixed costs in terms of uh, insulation, uh, but then you know with a, a much kind of higher energy capture. Uh, on top of that, and that, that's really what's driving uh, this um, compared to onshore. Um, and as you can see here, I mean, this is the manufacturers, um, really a very short timeline, and you can see how quickly they've uh, um, uh, moved up the kind of technology chain to uh, these, these enormous uh, new turbines. 
Um, so where's the market going? So as Mika said, I mean, we're at a um, still a modest amount globally, although we are, you know, mature markets in uh, Europe and, and rapidly maturing in China. So, you know, we're at something like, um, um, you know, 20 uh, 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 free gigawatts at the moment, but we move up very, very quickly. Um, and also the balance, um, you know, between different parts of the world uh, shifts very, very quickly. So we've already seen in this year that uh, China was the biggest uh, single market um, overtaking the UK. Um, and, you know, globally, Asia, we expect um, to become um, the largest uh, part of the market around, you know, slightly higher than, than Europe. A large part of that is China. But then if you look, um, there's a large part here, which is Asia X China, which, you know, will grow um, and will take on the, uh, the kind of fastest uh, uh, growth um, outside of Europe. Um, and then you have a, a kind of growing chunk from North America, but with a, a lot less um, uh, upside potential uh, uh, long term. So a large and, and steady market, but but not with the same uh, uh, growth potential as, as Asia. Now, this is um, a forecast until 2030, pretty much based on what's um, already happening. So this is a business as usual uh, scenario. However, as, as uh, Mika mentioned, uh, the ambition and the expectation uh, building down from the Paris agreements and from the IPC re I IPCC report and what all the institutions are expecting is much, much higher. So, you know, you have, um, um, you know, institutions like IRENA and the IEA, you know, who are already kind of forecasting over a terawatt of um, uh, uh, power from re of, from offshore wind by uh, 2050. So I'll, I'll just come back to that in a, in a, in a sec. Um, floating um, is increasingly uh, maturing. Um, you know, we're expecting something like 19 gigawatts up to 2030. Um, um, the first projects have been in place for quite a while. You know, we've seen the uh, capacity factors uh, from some of these, and they look pretty good. Um, I think uh, GWEC's recommendation would be that we move quite quickly now to uh, commercial deployment uh, rather than doing lots of more um, pilot projects i mean you know we think essentially the technology is 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 proven through some of these kind of large scale uh, pilots we see the field of different um deployment platforms kind of narrowing and really four uh large you know four platforms kind of emerging from that four maybe five uh, no more than that out of the kind of 20 or 30 um technologies that were being uh Put into the you know into the marketplace. You know we think those are now kind of converging on four or five um, platforms. Um, so our recommendation would be to go to kind of you know commercial scale platforms. Um, and it's interesting. Um, yesterday the UK government announced that there will now be um, a part of the auction system which will be effectively uh, ring fenced, ring fenced, or you know uh, put aside for floating within the auction uh, system and we're expecting um, other companies uh, sorry other countries to move in the same direction uh, one thing that was interesting from the large scale um, study that we carried out of non-oecd uh, countries with the world bank is that there's a lot of countries where floating um, resource is you know enormous and sometimes very close to uh, load uh, centers. So if you look at somewhere like the Philippines, uh, there's a lot of very good wind um, around the Manila uh, kind of region, uh, but it's floating. So you have to go to floating pretty much straight away. Um, and then I think the other factor is that uh, floating is going to give the wind industry a lot more flexibility about where and when it plugs into the grid. So the ability to be able to actually move uh, turbines and whole wind farms around um, you know, as grid uh, develops, is, is going to be um, um, important. Um, and then I think, as you know, people on the previous panel mentioned, um, you know, the role of oil and gas 
um, within uh, floating particularly is going to be very, very important. So we've already seen, you know, Shell um, uh, uh, get involved. Um, obviously, Equinor, uh, through its uh, high wind uh, projects, uh, is already involved. Uh, we're now seeing uh, Total um, uh, start to get involved um, in a big way. Um, and we can expect others uh, to come in um, now as well. We're seeing any uh, from Italy with uh, joint venture on offshore. Um, and as these companies present their carbon plans, um, either you know net zero or something towards net zero, um, they're going to have to go into offshore wind as the only way really to scale up um, in, in uh, uh, renewables. So... Um, I'll just um, say just one, one, a couple more things quickly. I mean, so within this terawatt, um, you know, Europe has now come out uh, through the trade associations, but also in close consultation with European governments and European Commission uh, for a 2050 vision of 450 gigawatts. Now, if you look at it, I mean, even though Europe's the most mature market, you know, it's, uh, if you look at the graph on the right, it's a, you know, it's a pretty phenomenal uh, aggressive uh, scale up and something that I don't think has been seen really in, in kind of any previous um, industry. So even in Europe, it's going to be an absolutely huge um, uh, challenge to do this. And it's going to require a whole new kind of scaling up of, of the supply chain, but also of, of skills and of, you know, training and, and having a workforce being able to do this. Um, and then if you think about, um, you know, a thousand gigawatts is what the world is expecting. That leaves another 550 gigawatts uh, to come from other places. Um, now, um, you know, we would expect Asia, as, as you've seen, to, to make up a very large part of that, you know, possibly up to kind of another 450 uh, gigawatts um, with, you know, um, some other regions, the US, possibly Southern Africa, um, maybe a bit in you know, places like Brazil, um, making up the rest. But um, it's going to be an absolutely huge challenge. And I think one of the things, you know, just to plant an idea, is that you know, European development was based around um, North Sea cooperation. So there's pretty friendly relations on the whole, uh, despite things like you know, Brexit um, in, in Europe. And, and there's cooperation between all the authorities in terms of grid, in terms of marine spatial planning and shipping and all these kind of things so the north sea really is a kind of integrated area where the supply chain uh, cooperates and components and ships and you know uh, turbines come from different countries uh, so it really is one area um, and i think as we look at asia and particularly you know east asia you know we need to be able to see how that's going to happen to a certain extent i think one of the kind of major challenges is um, the geopolitical uh, tensions in Asia and the kind of relative um, uh, lack of cooperation, particularly around um, uh, the seas and um, around territorial waters. Um, and then I think um, the other kind of major problem is, you know, um, you know we, we shouldn't kind of think that every country should set up its entire kind of own supply chain. Um, because what you're going to get is kind of inefficient supply chain clusters um, where you're kind of forcing um, the development of, of particular industrial sectors where they don't exist or where a country is not in a competitive advantage to, to create these sectors. And we can see in places like um, Taiwan where you know, uh, local content requirements have been forced through um, that it, it does kind of create some efficiencies and some tensions um, and not all the parts are, are, are in place. Um, and it's uh, you know, almost certainly not the cheapest way uh, or the most competitive way to, to do things. And we, we want to kind of avoid a situation where everybody has their own um, supply chain. Um, the issues around China um, are significant. You know, the fact that you know, you know, some countries will not use Chinese content um, and there's still barriers within China to, you know, uh, non-Chinese companies participating as well. So we think those kind of barriers and a general lack of cooperation could really slow things down, 
um, at a time when the expectation is that we move very, very uh, quickly. Um, let me just quickly just finish by saying something about Japan. I mean, as, as Mika has, has, um, has said, um, you, know, uh, you know, Japan has been on this journey for a while, um, ever since uh, Fukushima. Um, you know, it, it, progress has been relatively slow, although some uh, good uh, projects as, and, you know, pilots and, and, and such like have been carried out. Things are now starting to move, um, you know, much more quickly. Um, you know, we at GWEC, we think that 10 gigawatts is a realistic um, target for 2030. Uh, most of that's still fixed at this point, uh, but we're floating as a kind of growing percentage. And then beyond 2030, we're floating, taking a, a much higher part. I mean, the key point here uh, for us is that, you know, Japan shows um, at the moment very high costs. But that's because very little has been built. Um, if you build things, uh, the cost goes down. Um, but it requires uh, two things. I mean, it requires um, the ambition and um, you know, the, the, the setup of offshore wind to be done in a way that um, is built around scale and developing large scale um, in a kind of foreseeable way. Um, and it requires um, uh, government Hello, Ben. Uh, I'm support. sorry. Uh, but actually, that um, I'm, I'm uh, we have to go to the uh, another speaker. Is it fine? Yeah, I'm just going to finish. I've literally on my last or, slide. Or maybe so that you can please summarize. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So the key lesson for Japan, this is I'm literally this is my last slide. Is that you know this can be a large scale volume business, but it it needs to be large scale and it needs to be signaled as being large scale. If you do that, you're going to get a very competitive industry in Japan at in, uh, international levels very, very quickly. Um, if you move very slowly, you're going to get um, obviously an industry that's still quite niche and that's showing very high uh, cost levels. So, um, you know, I think the, 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 the government is moving on this um, and what we'd like to see is a clear uh, kind of target for the government. And we are working together with our partners in Japan on a, on a cost reduction study that will kind of show the potential uh, for doing this if the uh, volume targets are right. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, Ben, thank you very much for your very comprehensive overview of the global development of offshore wind, as well as the very good that um, 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 recommendation for Japanese market and then Japanese industry. Um, ben, would you please stay with us as live? And then I, that, uh, I would like to go to the next speaker, that uh, he is the president of the uh, Japan Wind Power Association, uh, Jin Kato. Kato-san, Thank you very much. Uh, on uh, offshore uh, wind, uh, the policy aspects of this uh, uh, various issues that offshore wind uh, has uh, is what I'd like to explain today. Uh, this is uh, the fifth uh, basic energy plan that uh, uh, was announced by the government. There are two uh, related to energy, and this is the fifth uh, basic energy plan. It was uh, announced in 2018 by the government, and every three years uh, the plan is reviewed. So. Uh, Next year, in 2021, uh, there will be another review. Uh, the major distinguishing feature here is that uh, uh, re uh, renewable energy, carbon-free uh, power source, uh, I uh, will be concentrating on uh, power. Uh, nuclear and uh, renewable energy will account for 40 percent to 44 uh, percent to achieve that in 2030. And that is the uh, major pillar of the basic energy plan. For this purpose, renewable energy to be positioned as uh, the major power source uh, is also uh, addressed in the basic uh, energy plan. But on the part of the uh, Wind Power Association, uh, 22 percent uh, of the 22 percent of renewable energy, what part will be accounted for by uh, wind? As you can see, uh, of all the power source, uh, it accounts for a mere 1.7 percent. That is uh, what is expected in the basic energy plan as it uh, presently stands. Within the basic energy plan, what I mentioned earlier, a carbon-free uh, power source uh, 
uh, in order to supply this. One of the major pillars is uh, nuclear. And uh, nuclear power is such uh, that uh, we are restarting uh, operations, but uh, there's a large uh, degra uh, delay in uh, the plan. Uh, so uh, presently, uh, to achieve 22% uh, of uh, power supply by 2030 is uh, very difficult, uh, according to uh, frequent discussions uh, made to this effect. Uh, uh, plants which have been approved for a restart uh, 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 will be working on uh, counterterrorism uh, uh, measures and safety measures, and uh, the situation is such that they may, may stop uh, op uh, stop operations once again. Uh, so uh, nuclear. Uh, a restart of operations uh, is uh, very difficult uh, at the moment. So uh, in 2030, what will uh, nuclear account for? Uh, there are discussions uh, going on uh, uh, here and there. There will be a shortage of uh, uh, 10 million uh, kilowatts uh, as a power source, and that is where we stand today. And uh, another uh, government announced uh, energy uh, document is uh, something which was decided uh, by the cabinet last year in uh, June toward uh, 2050. Uh, what uh, kind of uh, decarbonized society uh, do we uh, wish to uh, become? And uh, there's a vision uh, included in this document. Uh, firstly, uh, renewable energy to be economically uh, self-standing and to aim for it to become a major power source. Secondly. When it comes to nuclear power, the foremost priority would be safety, but as much as possible to reduce dependence. Uh, thirdly, in alignment with the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement, to uh, work on reduction of CO2 emissions uh, from uh, thermal power plants. Fourth point, uh, in uh, daily lives and in uh, the industry, as was discussed today, uh, to use uh, hydrogen, to uh, realize uh, the hydrogen society. And the last uh, vision is uh, uh, efficient use of heat, the promotion thereof, and to uh, create a uh, distributed uh, energy system to aim to do that. In Japan is uh, for the most part uh, dependent on imports for energy. Uh, so uh, the uh, promotion of uh, the uh, introduction of uh, renewable uh, energy uh, is not just uh, for uh, dealing with reducing uh, GHG gases from uh, global warming, uh, but it uh, makes for uh, self-sufficiency, and it also uh, is effective from the standpoint of uh, improving the trade balance. Uh, uh, by 2050 uh, to uh, reduce uh, globalization by 80 uh, percent. As you can see from here, at the power source, it's about 90 percent uh, uh, which have to be converted to uh, renewable energy. And uh, this is uh, such that uh, the traditional uh, power system uh, is totally different. So we have to create a totally different system uh, which we have to create. So uh, the government uh, has to have a major vision. Uh, targets were mentioned earlier, uh, but uh, clear uh, policies uh, need to be indicated. I feel that this is necessary. Uh, one of the major issues uh, for introducing uh, renewable energy, just to cite one, is uh, transmission lines. And this is often discussed, as uh, is uh, shown on this diagram. We have Hokkaido and Tohoku and uh, Tokyo. Uh, uh, for each of the regions, uh, there are TSOs, uh, which are uh, operating independently in Hokkaido in order to uh, introduce and uh, deploy uh, uh, renewable energy, you need uh, storage batteries. Uh, the reason being that uh, you can't uh, consume all of it in Hokkaido. Uh, where the wind situation is good in Hokkaido and in the Tohoku regions, uh, when you uh, generate power uh, that uh, power there, uh, if you were to transmit uh, over broad area to Tokyo, uh, it's uh, essential uh, to uh, operate uh, transmission lines in an integrated way. Uh, renewable energy should be uh, generated and uh, uh, consumed locally, it is often said. Uh, but uh, when it comes to offshore wind, uh, uh, like uh, as in the case of Large Dam, uh, 
Uh, if you, uh, the Kurobe Dam in the uh, Hokuriku er area uh, is a source uh, for sending power to Kansai. When it comes to Fukushima, Niigata, or Aomori, uh, there's a nuclear power plants which are generating power, and uh, the power is sent uh, to the metropolitan areas. In uh, this way, in uh, introducing uh, renewable energy, uh, Tohoku, Hokkaido's, uh, where there are uh, wind uh, resources, uh, large-scale uh, power generation, and the resulting uh, power must be sent to the metropolitan areas. And you need a system. You need to establish a system uh, for this. Under the present circumstances, you have independent TSOs responsible for each of their regions. Uh, so uh, starting uh, April, uh, there will be uh, unbundling of uh, generation and uh, transmission. So we need to move forward on this front so that there'll be a complete integrated operation. Uh, transmission uh, on a nationwide level uh, must be uh, operated in an integrated way. I believe this is essential. Uh, when it, it comes to challenges of offshore wind in Japan, I have uh, summarized this here, and it's often discussed uh, that um, the government's uh, medium to longer term uh, goals. Uh, uh, without this, uh, the industry uh, will not be willing to make investments or to create uh, supply chains. Uh, when uh, trying to do so, um, there will have to be uh, uh, an overall picture of the market, and uh, the probabilities have to be clear. Otherwise, uh, they cannot uh, take the steps. So a uh, creation of an uh, institution for this, and a master plan uh, for offshore wind. Uh, designation of uh, promotion areas and uh, and uh, also improvement of the grid along with this uh, for efficient uh, wind turbine creation uh, to improve the ports. Uh, all of these uh, have to be uh, included in uh, the introduction of uh, uh, offshore wind. Uh, and what is most important is that uh, there is no offshore wind industry in Japan. Uh, there is no uh, maritime uh, uh, industry. So uh, we need to uh, nurture and develop that industry. On the domestic scene, there are parts manufacturers for wind turbines, uh, generators, uh, ball bearings, motors. Uh, there are different manufacturers. Uh, and in the offshore world, uh, they are going uh, large size, and they have no experience uh, creating parts for a large uh, uh, offshore. Uh, so they need to make uh, capex. And uh, a, a political uh, goal uh, citing to what extent the offshore uh, wind will be introduced in Japan that will be absolutely essential, and cost competitiveness uh, will be very important. In the Netherlands, uh, there was a centralized uh, system where the government uh, prepared uh, the uh, seabed data and the wind uh, situation data. That was prepared by the government. And the industries uh, uh, would uh, create uh, a plant in designated areas, and they would uh, auction uh, based on uh, what the operational cost would be. Uh, so an auction system uh, with little burden for the industry uh, is uh, uh, has worked uh, a long way toward uh, reducing costs in Europe. To introduce such a system here in Japan is necessary. Offshore wind uh, to be deployed in Japan would mean uh, creating uh, new industries, which I uh, mentioned earlier. And uh, all this combined uh, would uh, lead to a stabilized market. And when the market is uh, stabilized, uh, the competition environment will be created. And uh, when the competition environment is there, technology innovation uh, will advance, uh, which in turn would reduce cost. When the cost is reduced, uh, uh, there will be increased deployment. So uh, first and foremost, uh, to uh, launch an industry in Japan. Uh, when an industry is created in Japan, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, in uh, the case of Japan, we uh, import energy. Uh, so by promoting offshore wind, uh, overseas uh, imports uh, naturally would be uh, reduced. And as a result, excuse me. GHG emission uh, would also uh, decrease. So uh, introducing offshore wind uh, for Japan uh, would be uh, killing uh, two birds with one stone, or maybe killing three birds with one stone. Uh, 
So uh, this uh, is an industry uh, which we need to go ahead uh, to uh, promote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kato. That was very comprehensive. Going forward to develop offshore wind in Japan, that is the creation of a new industry. Thank you for your advices. So that's the situation of Japan. And international actors are very active in Japan. Ersted of Denmark, Ben also mentioned, for example, in Europe, the oil industry is playing an important role. In the case of Ersted, yes, it was an oil uh, company, Sebastian. So in order to enter the Japanese market, any barriers experienced or going forward, uh, the potential of this area in Japan? Thank you very much. Thank you to the Renewable Energy Institute for inviting us here to, to speak. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about um, offshore wind uh, globally, uh, but also give um, an outlook for Japan from an uh, offshore wind developer's perspective. Um, so just briefly, um, Orsted, uh, my company, we have a vision to create a world that runs entirely on green energy. Um, we're a Danish state, majority state-owned uh, company. Uh, we're the global leader in offshore wind. Uh, we've built uh, just over five and a half gigawatts of offshore wind across the, the world. Um, and uh, actually, very, very soon, we'll be commissioning what will be the world's largest offshore wind farm, uh, Horn C1, which will be 1.2 gigawatts. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll go right into the, uh, the industry overview. And uh, I promise I didn't uh, cheat off uh, Ben's presentation, but there will be some similar themes here. Um, so I think, as Ben also pointed out, the uh, offshore wind industry has experienced quite explosive glo uh, global growth in the last couple of years. Um, in 2005, there was less than one gigawatt of offshore wind installed uh, in the world. Um, today, we're looking at uh, reaching almost 40 gigawatts. So that's in 15 years you've seen this huge uh, growth. Um, by 2030, um, we're expecting there to be just under 180 gigawatts of offshore wind. Um, I think these numbers may be slightly different from what um, GWEC presented. These are from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, so from their offshore wind outlook. Um, I think scale very quickly becomes a, a theme in uh, offshore wind. Um, so the scale of the global industry increased quite dramatically. Uh, if we look at uh, the individual uh, offshore wind farms, uh, the graph here, the two dark blue um, show the largest offshore wind farm in 2002. It was the 160 megawatt Horns Reef 1. Um, and what is currently the world's largest offshore wind farm, uh, Walney Extension, uh, which is just under 660 megawatts. Um, but looking out towards the future, looking at the kind of projects being built, not just in Europe, but in Taiwan and in the US as well, um, we can see that scale has become a huge part of modern offshore wind farms. They are between 600 and 1400 megawatts in size. Um, and this has been very, very important because scale um, really allows for increased optimization and it unlocks quite important economies of scale benefits. Uh, so on the left-hand side of the slide, um, this is for kind of an indexed average uh, project. If we look at the um, cost of a 200 megawatt project, compared to a 400 megawatt project, the scale benefits alone, on average, will see you reduce your uh, LCOE by 20% if you go from 200 to 400 megawatts. Um, if you go from 400 to 800, it's reduced by a further 10. Uh, and that's purely the scale benefits. Um, one of the reasons why scale has these benefits are shown on the, the right-hand side. Um, so again, kind of indexed uh, project costs. Um, but if you take the uh, development expenditures uh, per megawatt um, and compare them between a 600 and a 900 uh, megawatt offshore wind farm, um, your cost per megawatt in DVEX is reduced by over 30% just by increasing your project by about 300 megawatts. Um, similarly, when you look at the mobilization and installation costs, um, on average, you see about a 10% cost reduction um, per megawatt 
when you go from 600 to 900 megawatts. Um, and really, one of the reasons for this is that a lot of the uh, uh, vessels or um, time or investment you need to do the DIVX or the mobilization, um, you need to do them regardless of whether it's a small project or a large project. So if you can spread that cost over more megawatts, you of course get a, a lower cost per, per megawatt. Um, innovation has also played a crucial role. It's not just that the wind farms have been getting bigger. Uh, the industry has matured, uh, gotten a lot more professional. Um, so if you look at the technological uh, aspects, these are just some examples. Um, we're starting now to use bolted rather than grouted connections between the foundations and the uh, towers. Um, that on its own gives a cost reduction on the foundation scope of 15 to, to 20 percent. Um, if we look at the transmission, uh, we're now able to increase the capacity in the cables that take the power from the wind farm to the onshore grid. Um, that means we need less cables, we need less large offshore um, substations. Uh, that on average has helped reduce the capex of the transmission pieces by about 40 percent. On the commercial side, um, corporate PPAs are now starting to play a bigger and bigger role. Um, this matters because in uh, Europe, uh, offshore wind has you know, now become very cost competitive and we're starting to see uh, subsidy free offshore wind projects. Um, and corporate PPAs are a very effective way of reducing risks and costs um, and giving the developer still some sort of price certainty, uh, which will allow us to keep delivering those low costs. Um, finally, on the operations side, um, you know, we have to do uh, kind of these routine uh, maintenance checks uh, on an annual basis of the major components of the wind farms. Um, if we look at the blades of the wind farms, um, we used to have to do manual inspection, so you had a technician who would climb out onto the, the blade. Um, that would normally mean that the wind farm had to be shut for about a day. Uh, we've now started using drones with very um, high spec cameras, meaning that we can do what used to take a day in about 18 minutes. Um, same, we're deploying battery storage systems more and more now. Um, this helps us support the production scheduling um, and provide grid services. So, uh, you know, wind farms are not just great for providing um, uh, low emission, uh, large uh, amounts of uh, energy. Uh, they're also a very, very flexible asset that we think has huge potential to create benefits for um, system operations. So all of this, again, looking at Europe, um, has actually led to that in the last decade, offshore wind has gone from being the most expensive um, technology in Europe to actually being one of the cheapest. Um, and we're now competitive with uh, most uh, kind of um, other uh, energy technologies in Europe. Uh, this is a trend that we're seeing repeated in the US and in Taiwan. Um, just finally, uh, we think Japan could become a world leading offshore wind market. Um, the window of opportunity is open. Uh, we think offshore wind is gaining momentum in Japan. Um, you know, we believe that Japan needs offshore wind. 90% of energy demand is imported. There's a lack of onshore space. Um, and we're seeing strong political momentum with uh, both with a renewable energy uh, target of 24% by 2030, uh, as well as the beginning of offshore wind auctions. Uh, also, when we look at the potential actually for uh, offshore wind, uh, we think that there's more than 90 gigawatts of fixed bottom offshore wind potential in Japan. So you could build a lot of it. My final remarks uh, really are just for Japan to live up and fulfill this huge potential that we see for offshore wind. We think there are four things that will be needed. One is um, creating a framework that supports large scale wind farms. Uh, this is really critical to delivering low cost and we think for offshore wind to be successful in Japan, it needs to be low cost. Um, fixed government targets specifically for offshore wind will help supply chain in Japan also invest uh, and that'll really be important to building a local industry. Um, flexible frameworks, so the ability to adapt and optimize as you develop your wind farm, uh, as well as having industry-led localization efforts will be important. And then finally, we think a mix of international experience and local expertise will help unlock the most uh, effective market. Um, Japan should reap the benefits of the last 30 years of experiences. Um, 
and uh, the offshore wind industry should, of course, adapt to local circumstances. Thank you very much. Sebastian Herzogpurusan, domo. Thank you very much, Sebastian Hald Bull. Uh, next, uh, DBG Asset uh, Management. Uh, Mr. K Takahiro Kato, Executive Officer, Head of Global Fund Investment, uh, Institutional Investors, uh, and uh, in Individual Projects. He has extensive experience. He'll talk about the global and the Japanese circumstances. Mr. Kato. From DBG Asset Management, as was introduced, my name is Kato. We end up having a webinar today, if that's the case. Perhaps I should have prepared a presentation material, but I'm sorry. Normally, when I address people, perhaps it's better this way. I spend five minutes to seven minutes. You will end up just looking at my face because I don't have presentation materials. I hope you will bear with me. From the financial perspective, I would like to discuss renewables. If you look at Western investors for 20 years ago, the including uh, renewable, they started investing in infrastructure. The most advanced uh, institutional investor, for instance, l let us look at Canada, some Canadian pension funds. For 20% percent of the portfolio, they are investing in alternative assets, renewables, infrastructure, private equity. In these sectors, they are allocating their funds. Those are Canadian pension funds. Now, from the perspective of investors, renewables or real estate or infrastructure, the, what's the significance of the allocating their, the funds to real assets? I think there are two. First concerns diversification. More diversification, the better. There's another perspective. The fewer correlation to macroeconomic the factors, the risks due to the economic fluctuations, people want to diversify them. So for the long term, they would like to have a stable return. And then as a portfolio, there is a significance in allocating the funds to such sectors. For Since 10 years ago or so, the, uh, some advanced pension funds started investing in infrastructure or renewables, but compared with Western countries, the level is still low. As one movement, some pension funds three years ago or so in infrastructure, they started investing in infrastructure. In DBJ Group, 20 years, since about 20 years ago, we started investing in alternative sectors, private equity, infra fund, infrastructure fund. We made a lot of investment into these. Group as a whole, the, in terms of renewable PV assets, offshore wind, or biomass power generation in these sectors. Who, our group made uh, quite a lot of investment in these as well. F from institutional investors to make investment in renewables, what are the major points? That's something I would like to share with you today. One factor, creating a fund. The function of a fund, fun fund function is necessary. Now, institutional investors onshore or offshore power generation, the wind power generation, for institutional investors to make direct investments, there are difficult issues. There are three. First concerns human resources. Invest, institutional investors make a lot of investment. Only a few persons are looking at alternative sectors, meaning one person focusing just on renewables. That's not the reality. That's not happening. So when, we, when I try to discuss renewables, it's difficult for them to just understand what we are talking about. So the intermediaries, we need to have those go-betweeners. As for the investment instruments, instruments is the way you use through what types of instruments investment can be done. Institutional investors using investment trust, or token scheme, or special fund scheme, or other limited partnership investment. But in the case of renewables, if it's just look at PV, you look at a lot of schemes are done in the GKT scheme, GKTK scheme. But can investors directly make investments there in GKTK scheme? There are some difficulties. So again, the function of the fund is important. Second, after post-investment management. So after investment, how do you manage them? 
institutional investors, you know, regularly they look at net asset value, NAV, mark-to-market -market NAV. They want this. But in the case of Japan, investment in renewables for strategic investors, they don't do the mark-to-market -market assessment. Whether there is impairment or not impairment, accounting-wise, that's the only thing they do. So in that sense, the someone who functions as a fund should be there and do the mark-to-market -market valuation or other reports, something similar to ESG reports. Many investors demand such reports like ESG reports. So that kind of a function is necessary, in my opinion. Third, institutional investors are pretty passive investors in allocating the fund to alternative, the assets or renewables, that's a positive. But after allocating money, what can they do with business, the strategic investors? There are some difficulties here. For instance, the, even under the GKTK scheme, but what about the turbine maintenance? What kind of level should it maintain, the PV? What about the frequency of weeding? How much cost will be necessary for weeding? Investors are asked to make judgments. But for institutional investors to make such judgments, decisions, some difficulties here. And in that sense, for institutional investors to di directly invest, invest, it's rather difficult having a kind of intermediary like a function of a fund, I think, is necessary. Regarding the institutional design, for o offshore wind power generation to penetrate more into the Japanese market, there are various attempts to design the institution but FIT is one, FIP is another. Those are technical institutional designs. Of course, they are important, but at the same time, for institutional investors to make investments with ease of mind, renewable funds, infrastructure funds, we need to nurture, foster such funds. I think that's necessary here in Japan. As a gatekeeper, on behalf of investors, we receive their fund and the, the renewable funds and infrastructure funds. We make investments on behalf of them. When we do the investment together with the developers, uh, it's difficult for us to have consistent conversations. Sometimes we have difficulty trying to making ourselves understood. I think that's one of the greatest difficulties. Actually, there are many other things I would like to share with you, but I understand that the time seems to be limited. So in closing, just one more thing. Offshore wind power generation, five, sorry, by 2030, five gigawatts, that I've been talked about, 10 gigawatts, according to the pre uh, previous presentation. That requires a lot of fund, not just for strategic or business investors. Can they alone handle this? I'm not quite sure because it's significant. 10 electric power companies, they spend about 2 trillion yen as capex. All 10 companies combined in the listed Japanese funds, if you look at the PEV funds, all together, mark to market, that's just about 80 to 90 billion yen. And to make more investments, you need, definitely need the fund from institutional investors. To design institution, institutional investors should be treated as a stakeholder. If the market people, they look at them as one of the stakeholders, I think that would be uh, meaningful and significant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kato. Kato -san, oh, oh, oh. Uh, Mr. Kato, please come forward. We will start uh, the discussion. As uh, we heard from the presentations, what kind of mechanism or framework are required? There were suggestions already. Or presentation that what is requested to the Japanese government and then Japanese industries that the, to implement that the offshore wind at the large scale. And then how do you see the current status and then what is that your recommendation, additional recommendation to this status? So I think um, you know, things things are developing now in a kind of accelerated way, which is really good. And um, we're excited to see um, the first 
projects uh, get awarded um, in 2020 and start to see um, uh, you know construction uh, start on those as soon as possible. Um, but I think there's still quite a lot to do to define a kind of large scale um, auctioning system. Um, and I think again, I mean, having a um, a, a target um, and an ambition for offshore wind that's clear uh, is a key piece of this. And um, I think that's our message to the uh, Japanese um, government. Um, we have established, along with uh, Katosan and the Japan Wind Power Association, uh, an offshore um, industry task force uh, that will be working very closely with uh, METI and the other um, uh, ministries. And our message really is to try and help uh, kind of establish a level of ambition uh, for the next 10 and 20 and 30 years. And I think that will really give uh, the kind of long term visibility. Uh, which is going to be necessary to to have a kind of more accelerated uh, development. But yeah, we're very optimistic, and um, you yeah, know we do see things moving uh, quite quite quickly now. The Kato san. Thank you very much, Ben, Mr. Kato. And uh, my question also goes to Sebastian, Mr. Kato. You mentioned that as the will of the government of Japan, there must be numerical targets, there must be policy framework. That is what we have been asking for long. At the same time, for the national government to set up targets, what is happening right at the moment, for example, about the grid reinforcement or about the demand, social acceptance of different communities, going forward in 10 years at a 10 gigawatt level in 20 years or 30 years uh, to scale up and expand further. We need the sense of speed, but at the same time, what is really happening? There could be a gap between the expectation and the actual speed. What is your observation? Well, uh, indeed, uh, there's a gap. As uh, we say often, uh, reviewing fit uh, and development of the grid uh, these are pieces of the puzzle. So each of the pieces uh, are being discussed, and uh, the discussion uh, is uh, self-sufficient there. But the overall picture is not there as to how we'll go about doing this. Uh, there is no consistency, as uh, Mika has just mentioned, and as Ben has mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to uh, make for some speed here. Uh, the uh, government and uh, private sector must uh, together discuss this, uh, and GBEC and the association have uh, created a Japan Offshore Wind Task Force. And uh, from now, we'll be discussing this with the government so that in a smooth way, we can uh, deploy uh, offshore wind. Uh, one good thing is that uh, uh, round one uh, uh, involved uh, designated areas, uh, and the areas have been designated. So there has been one major development there. And uh, we have now to put together different uh, institutions uh, and integrate it and accelerate. I know. Sebastian, Ersted is an international company entering the Japanese market. You are working with your Japanese uh, partner in your development effort. Looking at other countries, large oil companies or utility companies are now engaged in the offshore wind. In the case of Japan, utilities are also becoming engaged. At the same time, the size, the scale or the scope and uh, to conduct offshore or onshore uh, wind. Uh, what about uh, the social acceptance? It's a very good question. Um, in general, we say about offshore wind that it, uh, it largely um, avoids the nimbyism issues because it's far out to sea, so you don't have uh, neighbors to, to annoy. Um, but of course, uh, there is one very big uh, marine user, uh, the fishermen, um, and I think it's uh, for offshore wind to be successful in Japan. I think it'll be very important that the offshore wind industry and the fishing industry um, continue the dialogue that I'm already seeing, um, because I think whenever offshore wind enters a new market, we've seen this in Taiwan or in the U.S. Um, or in Europe originally. Um, there is. I think quite a lot of uh, fear in the fishing industry about what sort of impact will you know these new turbines have um, on their livelihood. 
Um, thankfully, what we're seeing from long-term studies that are being conducted in Europe, um, there's actually relatively positive impacts. Uh, but I think it requires um, an open and honest uh, dialogue with the fishing industry to, to, I think, communicate this. And then I think for the offshore wind industry, it's important to understand how we can best um, be, you know, supportive local partners for the fishing industry. 네. Ben, a question. In Britain, it's a country with lots of fishing activities, but at the same time to do offshore wind. So the central government and the industry have to work together to create a new industry and a new market in the country. I understand there is a close collaboration. Can you tell us some success stories or experiences? One thing that the industry did in the UK, um, so there was um, an offshore wind industry um, council um, that involved uh, the private sector, so the, you know, the developers and the OEMs, um, and also uh, the government. Um, and that council um, had a, fisher, uh, a very credible um, fisher, uh, fishing uh, captain um, who was um, brought into that council and acted as a li liaison uh, between the wind industry and the um, fishing industry. And that um, captain was a very kind of credible, experienced uh, figure. Um, and, and that was a very important part of the council's work, was really to completely understand the concerns um, of the fishing industry and um, also to have um, somebody, somebody cre who credible who could talk to the fishing uh, communities and actually, uh, you know, uh, speak uh, the language and understand the kind of concerns uh, they had. Um, and then there was a series of kind of protocols that were put into place around uh, construction and then around operation. Um, and um, as uh, Sebastian has said, um, the actual experience for the fishing industry has been very, um, very uh, positive, and, and the studies that have been carried out show that the the you know, the net impact's been positive and there's also been um, a kind of regeneration um, around the kind of ports um, and the communities um, uh, and fishing communities in in the UK so there's some very uh, positive um, examples um, and we would recommend a, a kind of similar approach uh, for Japan and we're already kind of engaging uh, with different uh, parties to try and uh, uh, create uh, that kind of approach, so it can be done, um, and 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 it and I think it will be done. Um, and um, but I think the other point just to make is that, in terms of stakeholder management, you know, we should see stakeholder consult consultation as being a very very important part of projects and community engagement uh, is absolutely key. Um, so you know, winning. Uh, the support of people and, and, and having the understanding and the participation of people is very, very important for this. But it's also very important to have a process where stakeholder consultation is not seen as being a veto. So it's very good to consult with lots of different stakeholders and it's a very necessary part of the process. But that doesn't necessarily mean because, you know, one person objects or one particular interest objects that that should stop uh, things from happening. It's a, it's a matter of understanding the concern and seeing how it can be mitigated um, and seeing what the overall uh, impact is uh, within the process. But you know, we shouldn't, from the beginning, take every stakeholder um, kind of objection as meaning, def you know, meaning that we can't go ahead uh, uh, with something. So I think that's an important distinction. And it's very important for the government to take responsibility that there's a, um, a particular um, you know, institution, you know, the government that takes responsibility and, and when a decision is made that the government is legally uh, responsible. And where the process has worked well and where there's been proper stakeholder engagement, we've seen very little uh, legal challenges. Um, and, and I think, you know, if, uh, if things are done properly, we can, we, can, we can see that in Japan as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Kato, a question. In your presentation, there must be a huge finance, and therefore, investor is one of the stake.
a holder. Many people have already mentioned stakeholders. Specifically, in what way do you deal with the stakeholders? At the stage of designing the institutions, for instance, for offshore wind power generation, let us look at project development. There is a player who files an application with the bureaucracy, and then corporate can they sell the uh, shares of the company? Sometimes there are restraints. Sales of corporate shares is all right or not all right. There should be some flexibility. How do you take risk? How, because the, depending on the level of risks, uh, the people who fund will be different. If it's offshore, the, compared with PV and onshore, the uh, development period is longer. So there are investors who would like to make investment at early stage, and then, then there are different group of investors who would make an investment at later stage. They are character characters totally different. There's something we call the asset recycling. Project owners will change. So there are the changes in this designing institution to have some flexibility. How the financial market is moving or functioning, the policy the makers should understand. Otherwise, it would be difficult to design such an institution. So from the stage of designing institution, as just one stakeholder at the very edge, the people in the finance should also follow. Thank you very much. As the session for offshore wind, after the revision, we were organizing a workshop, but because of the coronavirus, this workshop had to be cancelled. And therefore, regarding offshore wind development with the industry people, we look forward to another opportunity, another occasion. But we have four and a half minutes left. And to each one of you, by 2030 and by 2050, when we think about that, what would be the gigawatt size of offshore wind in Japan at 2030 and at 2050? What needs to be done? Maybe 30 seconds is Mr. Kato, Sebastian, Mr. Kato Takahiro, and Ben in that order. Yes. Uh uh, the 2030 uh, target uh, is a transition uh, point, uh, 10 gigawatts, uh, which has been mentioned earlier. As the association says, government, uh, uh, if it uh, stretches itself in support, it's possible uh, the industry would be uh, able to do that. That's what we're, we're working with. The 2050 uh, wind vision is something that we're putting together at the moment. Uh, realistically speaking, uh, 30 years ago, uh, 30 years uh, hence, uh, 2 gigawatt uh, uh, would be 40 gigawatts. Uh, offshore would be 50 gigawatt, uh, 60 gigawatt. Uh, that's the realistic figures. Uh, that's where the realistic figures are expected to settle. And to uh, realize this, uh, what do we have to do? As I have been mentioning, uh, the uh, power system which has existed uh, now has to be completely revamped and changed. And uh, so uh, the government uh, must uh, show clear determination and must, the government must uh, communicate that. A long-term vision is necessary. I understand what you are saying. For example, the solar, the capacity factor is different, but 60 giga, uh, what uh, has been deployed and the offshore is 50 by 2050? Yes, yeah, so we're looking into that in the wind vision. I'll tell you the numbers later. For example, two gigawatts. If we ex take the figure of uh, two gigawatts, it will be 50 or 60. Um, so I hope it will be as large a number as possible. Um, I think the potential in Japan is immense. It's one of the world's largest energy markets. Um, I think there are uh, ambitious uh, political goals going on beyond uh, 2030. Um, you showed the 88% renewable energy target in 2050. Um, given the onshore constraints, um, we are thinking it could be a very, very big number. Um, I think 10 gigawatts in 2030 is theoretically possible. Um, a 2050 number, I think, is very difficult to say right now. Uh, maybe once we've had a few um, auction rounds and we start getting a better sense of the market, it'll, it'll be easier to say that. So I'm afraid to give you maybe a political answer there. But um, we think the potential is huge and that Japan could become one of the world's largest offshore wind markets by 2050. So, I think no fixed the number. Sorry. Thank you. Kato-san, so finance, uh, 
Can you tell us about the required financing by 2030 and 50? For one megawatt, how much is required? So the necessary megawatt, whether it's a 400 million or 500 million, you can calculate. The fixed bottom or the seabed type or floating type regarding the difference. As a perspective of finance, I think there's a big hurdle here when you look at the financial perspective. For floating type, Europe is a pioneer. There have been some precedents. And in terms of environment, it has to, we have to prepare. Otherwise, even there is a project for floating type, the hurdle can be high. Ben? Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get the first um, couple of gigawatts built. Um, and let's um, establish a, a target for 2030. I mean, I think um, the 10 gigawatt target is ambitious, but it, it is theoretically possible, as, as Sebastian said. And, and I think it, I think it can happen if we work to, work together. Um, and then I think once we've done that and established that, things will move much faster than anybody had imagined. And that's what we've seen in other parts of the world. So um, I'm very optimistic that Japan will play a very large part. Um, in, in the development of the kind of global uh, market uh, up to 2050. Thank you uh, very much. GBEC and JWPA in October, they are co-organizing a major symposium. So including such events at uh, our institute, uh, we will continue to work and cheer for the wind energy. Thank you.